Welcome to the second lecture in this module, Pirates and Privateers in New England and Beyond. So before you get into this lecture, just some things to think about. Uh, what is it that you already know about pirates and privateers? And then how much of that do you think is actually from uh, the myths that we see in pop culture? And then what of that information do you think is actually possibly closer to the truth? And then of course, how would you find out more other than this lecture itself? So in this lecture, we're gonna focus on three things. So the first one is really defining pirates versus privateers. And for the privateers, I'll give you some more information on um, them, especially with focus on the first one. So as the United States were, were gaining their independence. Next, we'll look at piracy within New England and, of course, far beyond that. And then finally, a case study on the pirate ship Widda, uh, which sank off of uh, Cape Cod. And in this uh, illustration, you can see here um, one of those ships within that is the ship Widda. So most of us have some romantic notions of what pirates were in the past. So typically there's this imagery like you see in this illustration by Don Mates of uh, this tanned and swarthy sailor and he's covered in scars and tattoos. Maybe he has a peg leg or a hook or an eye patch. This brace of pistols in a sash and the sword is out ready to board another ship or perhaps to demand the surrender of the captain. So this uh, very iconic image evolved from accounts published during the Golden Age of Piracy, which was considered to be from 1650 to 1730. And it really influenced novels, uh, illustrations, songs, and continued right through the ages um, into film and television. So many of these men who then stood trial as pirates became infamous as the stories uh, grew around their names and their representations as this sort of courageous rebel or the misunderstood adventurer that then became uh, ingrained in the cultural imagination. So the quote is from uh, Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer in 1875. He would be a pirate. That was it. How his name would fill the world and make people shudder. How gloriously he would go plowing the seas in his long, low, black-hulled racer, the spirit of the storm, with his grisly flag flying at the fore. So there's this very uh, idealized, romantic concept. But then who were pirates really? And how are they so different from privateers? And then what about these other words, these corsairs and buccaneers? So let's start with the definition of pirates. They were known to steal from anyone and everyone, any country or of any religion. It originated with the, the Greek word piarates, which basically means brigand. And it can be applied to a wide range of nautical misbehavior, including coastal raiding and intercepting ships on the high seas. And this could be anywhere in the world most commonly, uh, the definition was applied uh, in the Caribbean in the early 18th century. Robbery, kidnapping, and murder all qualify as piratical activities, provided there is some water and a boat involved. If there's no water and there's no boat, you're just a regular bandit. If there's a boat but no water, you need to go back to pirate school. And also then, if you were captured, you were hung. So what about this word, buccaneers? The term buccaneer is specific to pirates of the Caribbean and the Pacific coast of Central America. The name is derived from the French word boucan, which was a grill for smoking meat. It was first uh, used in the 17th century to describe French wild game hunters living in western Hispaniola, the island that's now Haiti and Dominican Republic. They usually sustained themselves by hunting, but they also committed piracy when the opportunity arose. So over time, these buccaneers uh, attracted uh, this multinational mix of adventurers and scoundrels, and eventually they migrated to Tortuga in about 1630. So the buccaneers' primary foe was Spain because they uh, formally controlled Hispaniola and Tortuga, and the, uh, the Spanish were constantly seeking to expel the outlaws from these islands. 
So in one Spanish attempt to drive away the, uh, the buccaneers, they attempted to exterminate all the game animals on the islands. Of course, it backfired. This left the buccaneers even more dependent than ever on raids of Spanish shipping. And these raids, in turn, endeared them to Spain's colonial rivals of England and France. And so these countries then offered uh, various forms of support. So when England then seized Jamaica from Spain in 1655, a lot of these buccaneers resettled there. So the memoirs of adventures written by buccaneers, such as William Dampier, influenced the depictions of pirates by the writers Daniel Defoe and Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote Treasure Island. And thus there were very important sources for the modern pop culture image that we have uh, of the golden age of piracy. So the first accounts of piracy that were written in the 18th century were in the style of morality plays. They're condemning these evil actions of those uh, committing piracy. And one of these uh, most influential early sources was um, the general history of pirates published in 1724 by Charles Johnson. And it tells the tales of over a dozen captains along with two women who were accused of that sin. The final chapter relates the last voyage of Captain William Kidd in 1696 and his subsequent trial in London. Since that publication, evidence has then surfaced that shows Kidd had actually sailed as a privateer. So what is a privateer? Privateers only attacked ships of the country or countries with whom their country was at war. They carried papers, known as letters of mark, to prove that they were sanctioned to attack their foes. As the name suggests, privateers were private individuals commissioned by governments to carry out quasi-military activities. They would then sail in their privately owned armed ships, robbing merchant vessels and pillaging settlements belonging to a rival country. The most famous of all privateers is probably the English Admiral Francis Drake, who made a fortune plundering Spanish settlements in the Americas after being granted a commission by Elizabeth I in 1572. Of course, the Spanish called him a pirate. The use of privateers allowed states to project maritime power beyond the capabilities of their regular navy, but there were some trade-offs because privateering was usually far more lucrative occupation than military service was, it tended to divert sailors and resources away from their regular navies. Privateering could also be a very shady business, and this accounts for some of the lexical overlap with the word pirate. So privateers sometimes went beyond their commissions, attacking vessels that didn't belong to the targeted country. So this extracurricular raiding and pillaging was indistinguishable from piracy as uh, was previously defined. So at other times, outlaw pirates would operate with the tacit encouragement of, of a particular government, but without their written legal authorization, these letters of mark, that were given to the privateers. So in these historical settings where um, such practices were common, the line between a privateer and a pirate could be blurred. Of course, if you were a privateer and you were captured, you would be considered a prisoner of war and you would not be hung like a pirate would. So then what about this term Corsair? The term Corsair is tied specifically to the Mediterranean Sea, where from roughly the late 14th century to the early 19th century, the Ottoman Empire dueled with the Christian states of Europe for maritime supremacy. On both sides, the struggle was waged with conventional navies and their state-sanctioned sea bandits called Corsairs. Corsairs were essentially privateers, although the term Corsair carried an added religious connotation because the conflict was between Muslim and Christian powers. Some of the most notorious of these were the Barbary Corsairs of North Africa, who were aligned with the Ottoman Empire, but they were often beyond the empire's actual ability to control them. So all of this is very far from North America. However, in the early 19th century, President Jefferson refused to pay a tribute to the Corsairs and thus began the first Barbary War in which American ships no longer had safe passage in the Mediterranean. We'll look at privateering more in the third lecture on the American revolutionary ties to maritime New Hampshire. But first, let's look at how privateering actually functioned. So, Colonies in North America granted commissions to privateers long before the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. 
Uh, these would be outlined in letters of mark, also known as letters of mark and reprisal. And that would outline their commission and would have been similar to this one here on the left, signed by President John Adams in 1799. These documents stated the terms privateers worked by. These included obeying the laws of war, honoring treaty obligations, and treating captives with courtesy. So the privateers were not paid directly by the commissioning government. Instead, they wrested their profits from captured enemies. Usually these were the French or Spanish before the American Revolutionary War. So then all captured prizes had to be brought into port and taken before an admiralty court. The ships and cargo would be sold at auction and the profits would then be divided between the crew and the owner of the privateer vessel. If the privateer failed to live up to obligations and terms on their letter of mark, the court could revoke their commission and then refuse to award them the prize monies. So during the American Revolutionary War, privateers even had to put up a bond to ensure their good conduct. Privateering eventually became illegal in Europe with the signing of the 1856 Paris Declaration respecting maritime law. The U.S. followed later in the century. And then in 1907 at the Hague Peace Conference, the eradication of privateering became part of international law. Although issuing letters of mark and reprisal is still an enumerated power of Congress and is outlined in Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. So let's get into piracy in New England and of course far beyond. So I'm going to give you an overview of some of the pirates uh, here in New England. Um, and there were definitely some known characters here, although none of them are directly associated with Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, some were known to operate from the Isle of Shoals at the entrance to the Piscataqua River. And there was even a woman pirate. So while the warm Caribbean climes are naturally thought of as pirate territory, it's often forgotten that they summered in New England hideaways. They started to appear in New England as early as the 1630s, and right through the 1720s, New England was very closely associated with piracy. So according to historian Stephen O'Neill, about 20% of the pirates in the golden age of piracy, which is seen to be about 1650 to 1730, were New Englanders. Far from being universally feared, pirates were at one time really welcomed with open arms into the cities uh, such as Boston and Newport. Because the colonies were fairly poor and pirates were the only people who really had hard cash, uh, this really benefited both parties. So by selling their stolen goods in these ports that were providing them with uh, safe havens or asylums, both the pirates and the colonial populations benefited. Several pirates were very well known for their exploits in New England. So let's just focus on these uh, first four, and then there's a couple more after this. So uh, first off, there's Dixie Bull. So in 1632, he was trading for furs in the Penobscot Bay in Maine when a roving company of French pirates seized all of his provisions, leaving him destitute. He then persuaded some other fishermen, traders, and seamen of the colonies to join him in plundering trading vessels along the New England coast, and also in attacking uh, trading posts on shore, and one of these included uh, the Pemaquid settlement, and thus he became uh, known as New England's first pirate. The authorities sent an expedition against him, uh, but he was nowhere to be found. So Bull then disappeared from the New England area in 1633. Some claim that he joined the French, and others maintain that he had returned to England. Next up is Thomas II. He was actually born in Rhode Island and started as a licensed privateersman. In the Red Sea, he successfully plundered Arabian and Indian cargoes. The governor, Thomas Fletcher of New York, described him as a very pleasant man who tells wonderful stories. So this is what this illustration is showing him uh, sitting there with the governor. Unfortunately, uh, Governor Fletcher was eventually fired by the king for being too friendly with the pirate too. In June of 1695, two was shot, and he was then, uh, which killed him, while boarding a prize ship owned by the Great Mogul of India. Next up is Ned Lowe. So his career, again, these are all very short. 
1721 to 1724 that he operated. He was a Boston shiprigger originally, and he turned to piracy. During his uh, career, he earned a reputation for extreme cruelty. So after capturing a Nantucket whaler, Lowe made uh, the commander eat his own sliced off ears sprinkled with salt before he killed him. Eventually, it was so bad that his own crew set him adrift in an open boat without provisions. He thought he'd had some luck because two days later, a French ship rescued him. But on discovering who he was, the French gave him a very short trial and hanged him. And the last on this short list for those uh, specifically associated with New England uh, is the woman Rachel Wall. Though she was far less uh, famous than um, the women Anne Bonny and Mary Reed down in uh, the Caribbean, she became a pirate with her husband George, a Boston fisherman. Their career of crime began when they stole uh, a ship out of Essex, Massachusetts, and then they began pirating off the Isle of Shoals. Pretending to be in distress, Rachel would cry for help while the rest of the men hid on the boat. When the rescuers arrived, George and his men would then kill them, rob them of valuables, sink their ships. Unfortunately, in 1782, her husband drowned in a storm. She was rescued, uh, but soon after in Boston, she was accused and convicted of murdering a sailor, a crime that she denied. At her hanging in 1789, she confessed to being a pirate. She is the only known woman pirate of New England. One of the more famous pirates uh, who is known to have terrorized the New England coast was Blackbeard, also known as Edward Teach. Uh, his career was very short, only 18 months from 1716 to 1718. So supposedly he and, uh, and his sizable crew um, landed at Lunging Island in the Isle of Shoals off Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And there it is said that he has buried a large treasure of silver bars, which of course has never been discovered. So then in 1717, uh, he captured the slave ship La Concorde and he renamed it the Queen Anne's Revenge. Unfortunately, just before he was killed at Ocracoke in 1718, his flagship hit a shoal near Beaufort, North Carolina, and he had to abandon the ship. After removing everything of value, of course. On this shipwreck, I participated as a maritime archaeologist uh, for over four years, bringing up cannons, pewter plates, and other artifacts for conservation. So let's take a look at that. The ship, Queen Anne's Revenge, would have looked much like uh, this plan of the French ship La Mercure. Of course, it looks nothing like that 300 years later. Instead, it is these scattered chunks of artifacts. Much of it is buried beneath sand and ballast stones about 25 feet underwater. So this map is showing the location of objects of everything that's been excavated so far on site. Because the, the wreck itself sits at the mouth of a river, visibility is usually very low. But when you can see through the mark in the water, you can spot a few artifacts without actually digging, such as this, which is an anchor ring, and it is centrally located uh, on the heap of cannons in the middle. For this particular shipwreck, the action of hurricanes and the nearby dredging of a channel has been exposing the artifacts and the state of North Carolina decided to do a full excavation. The project works from this barge, which would be anchored on the site, and each square that was shown on the map is carefully exposed by divers uh, for recording of, of what's there. And these are five by five squares. So any dredging that happens where the sand is, is sucked out of the way, all of this comes up on deck and is run through uh, a sluice box, uh, such as you see here. It's the same as what uh, is actually used for panning for gold. And believe it or not, at times we actually found uh, little bits of gold dust, but mostly it was the small lead shot. All artifacts are then numbered, mapped in place, and when everything is ready, they'll be lifted to the surface. So especially for larger objects, this is a lot uh, more difficult and couldn't be done with a smaller crane. So here you see the yellow uh, lift bags that have brought the object to the surface, and then the crane on the NOAA boat is uh, assisting us. And finally, when everything is prepared, uh, we can transport things to uh, the conservation lab. 
Once they're completely prepared and studied, they go on display at the local maritime museum. Amazingly, some of these pieces really take a long time. Uh, things such as this cannon you see here could take up to two years to actually flush out the salts uh, via an electrolysis process. Finally, we have the case of Captain William Kidd, who had far stronger connections to New England. You can see him here on the left in a uh, picture of himself as a gentleman wearing a powdered wig. So in the general history of pirates, written in 1724, Kidd is portrayed as an evil pirate. Yet he had received privateering commissions from New York and Massachusetts during the War of the Grand Alliance, which was in 1688 to, to 97. So in 1695, uh, the governor Belmont, on behalf of the crown, uh, asked Kidd to take a commission to hunt down pirates along with enemy French ships. Kidd went to England to accept a letter of mark from uh, King William III, and this is shown here uh, in the picture. You can see all the, the fancy handwriting from the day. So with the help of investors, Kidd purchased a new ship called the Adventure Galley. And the word galley, uh, it basically shows that uh, it, it describes a ship that has oars to help maneuver it in light winds. On the way back on the return voyage to New York, he captured one French ship. But uh, on his pirate hunt after that, he met with ill luck. They found no ships off of Madagascar where they were searching. When one of the sailors aboard Moore argued with Kidd about attacking a Dutch ship, uh, the fight ended when Kidd hit him in the head with a bucket. The impact fractured Moore's skull, killing him. So of course, Admiralty law really allows for a harsh discipline aboard ships, but they don't sanction outright murder. In 1698, Kidd and his crew finally took a prize. The Keta Merchant, or also known as the Kara Merchant, held an extremely valuable cargo of silks, silver, and gold. When they captured, sh when they captured the ship, it was flying the French flag and it carried French passes that promised the protection of the French crown. However, the ship itself was East Indian and it had been hired by Armenian merchants that were doing business with London and it was under the command of an Englishman, Captain Wright. So despite the tenuous claims that it was a French ship, Kidd allowed the crew to take the prize. And he held on to those French passes as proof of the legality of this as a, a privateering prize. Unfortunately, in the years since he'd left England, politics had shifted and those who had invested in him and supported him uh, now basically set him up as a scapegoat. So after the capture of the prize, Kidd's crew divided. Many of them went off to join a known pirate, Robert Culliford. And Kidd took the Keta merchant with his few crew left off to Hispaniola and what is now the Dominican Republic. He left the ship there and um, hearing that he'd been charged as a pirate, headed off to New England to clear his name. Legend has it that on the way, of course, he buried treasure um, and uh, it's thought to be on Gardner's Island near New York. On his arrival, Government Belmont double-crossed him. He was promising him clemency and then had him arrested when he was in Boston. Kidd was shipped off to London for his trial. Unfortunately, his backers had deserted him. Even the French passes had gone missing at the trial. These were actually found uh, hundreds of years later. Uh, in about the early 1900s, the files of papers from the 1700s were found misfiled along, uh, among other government papers. So Kidd was convicted at the Admiralty Court uh, for acts of piracy and the murder of Moore. In 1701, he was hung at Execution Dock in Wapping. His body was then tarred and left on display as a warning to would-be pirates. In 2007, the wreck of Captain Kidd's prize, Keta Merchant, was found off Catalina Island in the Dominican Republic. A few years later, I participated as a student investigating what was left of the ship. Again, like the Queen Anne's Revenge, you can see from this site plan, very little actually remains of the vessel. 
When his cohort found out that Captain Kidd had been arrested in Boston, they needed to get rid of any evidence. So they stripped the vessel down, set it on fire, and then set it adrift. So this was about 1699. So while we were investigating, there was cannons, there was this ballast pile, and with some careful examination, we found exposed wood showing the hull construction. Key elements of this construction uh, included the actual type of wood, which is a teak, and then the construction itself for holding the planks together was a mortise and tenon configuration. So looking at this photo over on the right hand side, you have this section of exposed planking, which is um, sitting here between a cannon on this side and a lump of ballast uh, and artifacts here. And you can see another cannon sticking out of that pile on that side. So all of these clues uh, confirm the probability that this is the wreck of Captain Kidd's last prize. So from maritime archaeological investigations, we move on to what is rather euphemistically known as commercial archaeology. So let's move on to the pirate ship Witta. The key factor in this case study is the controversy that surrounds the method of recovering artifacts and how they are then used. Much of which uh, this controversy centers on the main figure, Barry Clifford, who calls himself an underwater adventurer. And he was the one who first found uh, the wreck in 1984. So let's start with the story of the ship and the crew, and then we'll look at the so-called archaeology and the controversies that have arisen. The Witta was a fully rigged galley ship. So shown here uh, in the painting on the right, you can see uh, a galley ship has oars, so in light winds they can uh, still move. So it was originally built as a passenger, cargo, and slave ship. Sir Humphrey Morris, known as the foremost London slave merchant of his day, commissioned the ship to be built in 1715 in England. A square-rigged, three-masted ship, it measured 110 feet in length and had a tonnage rating of 300 tons. It could travel at speeds up to 13 knots, which is about 15 miles an hour. Christened the Widda after the West African slave trading kingdom, the vessel was configured as a heavily armed trading and transport vessel. It set out for its maiden voyage in early 1716, carrying a variety of goods to exchange for delivery, trade, and slaves in West Africa. The trip traveled down West Africa along modern day Gambia and Senegal to Nigeria and Benin, where its namesake port is located. The Witta left Africa with an estimated 500 slaves aboard, along with gold, including a con jewelry and ivory. It traveled to the Caribbean, where it traded and sold the cargo and slaves for precious metals, sugar, indigo, rum, ginger, and medicinal ingredients, which were then to be transported back to England. The ship also carried a complement of 18 uh, six-pounder cannons to defend itself. But on the return leg of its maiden voyage in the Triangle Trade, it instead began a new role in the golden age of piracy when it was captured by the pirate Samuel, or Black Sam, Bellamy. This pirate was born in 1689 in the rural English village of Hitsley, Devon. He grew up to become a sailor and moved to New England after the War of Spanish Succession, which was about 1702 to 1712. While in the colonies, he fell in love with Maria Hallett of East of Mass, but her parents did not approve of a marriage to a lowly sailor. In 1715, Bellamy set off with his friend, Paulsgrave Williams, and together they went to seek their fortune. They turned to pirating, and in a year they plundered more than 50 ships. They called themselves Robin Hood's men, and Bellamy became known for his mercy and generosity towards those he captured. In late February 1717, Bellamy was in possession of two vessels, the 26-gun galley Sultana and the converted 10-gun sloop Marianne, 
which was captained by his friend Williams. They found the Witta under the command of Captain Lawrence Prince navigating between uh, in the channel between Cuba and Hispaniola. After a three-day chase, Captain Prince finally surrendered near the Bahamas, but with only a limited exchange of cannon fire. In a gesture of goodwill towards Captain Prince, who had surrendered with minimal struggle, Bellamy gave him the ship Sultana along with a 20 pounds in silver and gold. Bellamy then took the Witta as his new flagship. The cargo of the Witta included gold and silver worth more than 20 pounds sterling. Combined together with the plunder from earlier ships he had captured, Bellamy would finally amass the fortune he had been seeking. They could now return to Massachusetts and hopefully he would gain Maria Hallett's hand in marriage. They fitted the widow with 10 additional cannons and 150 members of Bellamy's crew uh, manned the vessel. They got rid of the structures that made the ship top heavy. They cleared the deck of a pilot's cabin and removed the slave barricades. Bellamy and his crew then sailed on to the Carolinas and headed north along the eastern coastline of the American colonies, looting and capturing additional vessels along the way. At some point, Bellamy also added another 30 cannons uh, below decks, possibly as ballast. Then on the 26th of April, 1717, near Chatham, Massachusetts, the Witta approached a thick gray fog bank rolling along the water. This was a signal of bad weather ahead. That day, the pirates had captured the ship Mary Ann with a hold full of Madeira wine. The captain of that ship refused Bellamy's request to pilot them up the coast. So Bellamy took him by force along with five of his crew aboard the Witta. Then Bellamy sent five of his own crew, along with the carpenter Thomas South, who had refused to join the pirates, and sent them on board the Marianne to join the three uh, remaining original crew. South later testified that he had chosen to accompany the pirates aboard the Mary Ann in hopes of escaping, possibly by swimming ashore near the Cape. Sometime around sunset that evening, the winds completely died and the four ships in Bellamy's fleet lost sight of one another when a massive fog bank eliminated, eliminated visibility. The other ships, Anne's galley and Fisher moved out to sea. Eventually, they made it to Deramascove Island off of Booth Bay Harbor. His friend, Palsgrave Williams, um, pulled his ship uh, earlier in the day into Block Island to go and visit some relatives. Um, after he had organized with Bellamy to meet him off the coast of Maine. The weather then turned into a violent nor'easter, a storm with gale force winds, which forced the vessels into the shoals of Cape Cod. The widow ran aground at what today is Marconi Beach at Wellfleet, Massachusetts. At midnight, Witta had hit a sandbar, bow first in 16 feet of water, about 500 feet from shore. The storm pummeled the ship with 70 mile an hour winds and 30 foot waves. The main mast snapped over, pulling the crew into a, uh, the ship itself into about 30 feet of water, and there it violently capsized the crew. The wreck sent most of the crew to their deaths, along with several tons of silver and gold, and the 60 cannons all went to the ocean floor. The weight of the tumbling cannon ripped through the decks and it quickly broke apart the ship, scattering pieces and thousands of objects along the beach. One of the two surviving members of Bellany's crew, Thomas Davis, testified in a subsequent trial that in only a quarter of an hour after the ship struck, the main mast was carried by the board and in the morning she was beat to pieces. By morning, Hundreds of Cape Cod wreckers salvaged the remains. Hearing of the shipwreck, Governor Samuel Shute sent Captain Southwick, a local salvager and cartographer, 
to recover any of the money, bullion, treasure, goods, and merchandises taken out of said ship. Once Southwick arrived at the beach on the 3rd of May, he noted part of the ship was still visible, breaching the water's surface. But most of the ship's wreckage had scattered along about four miles of the shoreline. According to accounts from surviving members of the crew, the Witta had carried about four and a half tons of silver, gold, gold dust, and jewelry. And this had been divided equally into about 180 50 pound sacks for storage in the ship. Although Southack did salvage some items of the ship, little of the massive treasure hoard was actually recovered. Southack wrote in his account of the findings that the riches with the guns would be buried in the sand. And with that, the exact location of the ship and its loot were lost. And it came to be thought of as nothing more than a legend. So on a map that he made of the wreck site, Southwick reported the burial of 102 of the Witta crew and captives lost in the sinking. Of the 144 souls aboard the Witta, only two men are known to have made it to the beach alive, Welshman Thomas Davis and the 18-year-old Central American Mosquito Indian John Julian. The Mary Ann was also wrecked about 10 miles south at Putchett Island. All the crew of men on board had survived. All told, nine of Bellamy's crew survived the wrecking of the two ships. However, Justice Joseph Doan and his posse quickly captured them and sent them all for a trial in Boston. On the 18th of October, 1717, six men of the crew were found guilty and sentenced to be hung. John Julian, the Mosquito Indian, was the only one spared, but sold into slavery. The two carpenters, Thomas South and Thomas Davis, were tried separately. And because they had been forced conscripts into a life of piracy, they were acquitted of all charges. And so the story of Bellamy and his pirates comes to an end, except for Bellamy's friend, Palsgrave Williams. On hearing of the wreck and the death of his friend, Williams returned to the Caribbean and soon after accepted the pardon offered by King George to all pirates who then surrendered. Legend has it he retired from the sea to settle down with a wife and years later died peacefully in his bed. Barry Clifford found the Widder's wreck in 1984, relying heavily on Captain Southwick's 1717 map of where the wreck site was. And this led him to what was an unprecedented find, that the Widder had actually eluded discovery for over 260 years became even more surprising when the wreck was found under just 14 feet of water and five feet of sand. The ship's location has now been the site of extensive excavation and more than 200,000 individual artifacts have been retrieved. One major find in the fall of 1985 was the ship's bell shown here. It is inscribed with the words, the Witta Galley 1716. With that, the Witta became the first ever pirate shipwreck with its identity having been established and authenticated without a doubt. So the work on the site by Clifford's dive team has continued almost on an annual basis. And the selected artifacts from the wreck uh, that have been conserved are on display at Expedition Witta Sea Lab and Learning Center out in Provincetown on the Cape and a selection of the artifacts that were on tour across the United States as a traveling exhibit are now housed at the Widda Pirate Museum in West Yarmouth, Massachusetts. But Clifford's handling of the Widda and other shipwrecks has come under fire from a range of critics who accuse him 
of being something of a pirate himself, mishandling archaeological sites, telling tall tales to further his own interests, and even intimidating people who stand in the way. So what are these controversies? So the biggest issue is the difference between archaeology and salvage, which could also be called treasure hunting. Archaeology is methodical, and it's not motivated by profit, but by gaining of information. Salvage is not methodical and often has the same impacts as looting. The artifacts often end up being collected for their perceived value on the market, such as gold. And in the process of retrieving those, say, gold pieces, other less commodified objects, such as the fragile wood of a ship or the layers that you see here in this illustration, will be damaged as they are dug through to get at the very object deemed worthy. So, although Clifford claims strict adherence to ecological standards have been used on the Witta, his methods are often proved flawed and his statements are often disproved later in later investigations. Uh, so the following is taken mainly from an article in the Portland Press Herald. I think Barry is just a journalism attraction, says Ulrike Guerin, secretary for the Convention of Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage at UNESCO. So this was established in 2001 as a way for protection of these sites, this UNESCO convention. So the UNESCO uh, office has issued assessments of Clifford's poor handling of wreck sites, both in Haiti and Madagascar, after being asked to review them by those countries' governments. They've stated there was no real archeological work and there was destruction to the site itself, which Guerin says of uh, his activities in Madagascar. There Clifford claimed to have found Captain William Kidd's uh, initial ship, the Adventure Galley. This is really treasure hunting behavior. So, Part of the, the controversial of, of the um, treasure hunting started off with his Clifford's team discovering the remains of the Witta in the surf off Cape Cod. So other people on his team have outed uh, some of his methods. According to Stephen Kiesling, who was hired to co-write a book about the project, Clifford rushed to expose the entire Witta site as fast as possible before the arrival of an archaeologist who, under Massachusetts law, is supposed to be overseeing all the work. Kiesling recalls, they opened up the entire area to see what was there, and in doing so, they homogenized it. So this is like the site itself gets stirred together. You go in, you find the thing, you immediately dig it up to see if anything is there, and after that, you call in the archaeologists and authenticate it so you can start making money off of it. At least this is what Kiesling reveals in his tale, which is published as Walking the Plank, a true adventure among pirates. Rob McClung, one of Kiesling's key sources for this book, was a childhood friend of Clifford's. And in the 1980s, he was Clifford's business partner, raising money from investors, introducing Clifford to the Kennedys, and running the dive operations on the Witta and other wrecks. McClung said that Clifford would literally plant artifacts from one wreck site onto another, or put previously uh, retrieved artifacts back on the seafloor so that he could discover them in front of camera crews. According to McClung, it was an ongoing fiasco because the biggest problem we had was Barry. In a nutshell, he was the ringleader. It was a Barnum and Bailey circus. And during that six years that I spent with Barry trying to run that project, every time I turned around, I felt like I was being railroaded. And he would even ask me to say things that weren't true. McClung states that he's the one who in 1885 discovered Widow's Bell. He says he had it raised, 
They brought it to the lab to be cataloged, even before calling Clifford, who had been in New York at the time. McClung says, Clifford went ballistic, flew back up to the Cape, and we loaded everything, took it back to the site underwater, and put it back in. Shortly thereafter, Clifford had them raise it all again in front of a television crew. So as far as artifacts went, he just kept moving stuff around. And this is not good archaeology. So in this chaotic situation, information about the wreck could actually get lost. And this tension is then reflected in the reaction by uh, academic uh, archaeological community. So the first archaeologist who worked with the Witta, Edmund Delfleson, literally jumped ship while they were searching for the Witta in 1983. He waded ashore on Wellfleet Beach after allegedly discovering that he had little control over the fieldwork that was happening. In 1995, Boston University archaeological professor Ed Ricardo Elia published a paper in a leading academic journal entitled the Ethics of Collaboration, Archaeologists, and the Witta Project. In it, he argued that participation in such commercial salvage projects contributed to the exploitation of the resource base, i.e. the ships, and the conversion of public patrimony into private gain. Clifford states that the academics have been after him from the start, motivated by hostility towards private sector archaeology. He states he's been attacked by academics who believe that anybody who uses their own money is a treasure hunter, insisting that all artifacts from the Witta have provenance and that they have never sold any of them, supposedly proving that the private sector can do archaeology. And yet he fails to see this basic contradiction uh, within the methods of excavating uh, for profit on a, on a piece of cultural heritage. Clifford's more recent critics include uh, UNESCO, the United Nations Cultural Agency, which sent technical experts to Haiti and Madagascar at the request of those countries' governments to investigate his handling of wreck sites. In 2014, Clifford proclaimed he'd found Christopher Columbus's Santa Maria, which had sunk off Haiti in 1492. UNESCO's underwater archaeologists dove the site and found fasteners of a type that wasn't invented until 300 years after that sinking in uh, the 15th century. The vessel, they concluded, could not possibly be the Santa Maria. From 1999 until 2015, Clifford's team also explored Santa Maria Harbor, a notorious pirate lair in Madagascar, where they announced that they had found Captain William Kidd's adventure galley. The pirate Christopher Condon's fiery dragon and some other wrecks. In May of 2015, Clifford announced he'd found a hundred pound silver ingot on the Kidd site and presented it to Madagascar's president on the shore in a televised ceremony on the beach, which Clifford attended in full dive gear as if he had just come up from the depths. A UNESCO team visited the site and concluded that the so-called adventure galley shipwreck wasn't a ship at all, but rather a broken part of the St. Marie port constructions. And in looking at the fiery dragon, which was a large Asian ship, they said, Several gold coins that had been found there were actually missing from museum inventories where they were supposed to be kept. And finally, the tests of the ingot presented um, to the president was actually a lead ballast piece. Apparently, Barry Clifford had not even the slightest test made, states Guerin of UNESCO. He took a piece of metal out of the bay and all of a sudden it was pirate treasure. The UNESCO team's final report concluded the recovery, inventory, storage and conservation of the finds has been carried out in an unscientific manner without the necessary precautions and leading to the damage of the sites as well as making it more difficult to understand 
the historic background of those sites. Guerin is more blunt. There was no archaeological work. There was destruction. In his defense, Clifford points out his museums at Provincetown and Yarmouth, Massachusetts, and his laboratory that's filled with thousands of artifacts from the wreck. He says they call us hunt treasure hunters, but in 35 years, we've never sold anything, and it's all stayed together. Clifford recently publicized the discovery of a large metallic mass at the Witta site, and he's convinced that this represents most, if not all, of the 400,000 coins and the other riches that have still not been recovered from the Witta. Maritime archaeologists and historians say that they're intrigued, but remain skeptical, mostly because he's been disproved on other finds. Barry Clifford's many proofs can be very exciting if they can be verified with photographs or scientific proof, said Paul Johnson, a curator at Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. Until then, it's just talk. Victor Mastone, the chief archaeologist for the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources, which oversees shipwrecks and other undersea finds, suggests perhaps the pirates were simply been lying. Did they brag more than they should have? Who knows, he said. We know that the pirates said they had. So, what do you think? So in this lecture, we've covered the difference between pirates and privateers and looked at some of the stories of those characters. In investigating the past, we've seen that history and myth often overlap. The tales remain popular, giving rise to a pop culture media outpouring of movies such as Pirates of the Caribbean and TV shows such as Black Sails. We've seen that archaeological research, such as that of the um, Queen Anne's Revenge and the Kedah Merchant, can really augment this history. We've also looked at the case study of the Witta, which was confirmed as that pirate ship by the find of the bell. We've looked at some of the controversies that can come up between uh, the archaeology and the treasure hunting or salvage and how that salvage or, or treasure hunting, what really comes up is uh, around the profit motives and how the money is made. So then you have to ask that although the Widow Museums provide this public outreach, does this on the plus side, does this mean that somehow they've done this good and therefore the shoddy archaeology could be ignored? And what may have been lost uh, to history by their flawed methods of study? So this concludes lecture two. I highly recommend going straight to the quiz next before continuing on to the next lecture.